Welcome to the top M&A entrepreneurs. Today, my guest is Chase Murdoch. Chase has made five acquisitions. So we're going to hear talk about his story. Welcome to the show, Chase. Thanks, John. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. So let's uh, start back. I mean, uh, what were you doing before uh, you got into acquisitions? Yeah, uh, a lot of zero to one. So not a lot of this one to two business that we're currently engaged in. So I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Um, and typically what's that, what that's meant is pursuing moonshot ventures, um, you know, raising venture capital and trying to build a business that's not small, that ideally, if successful, is the opposite of small. And so it wasn't until the past uh, seven or eight years that I've really fallen in love with the world of small business, which is where we spend our time today. Yeah. Now, how many experiences did you have in the venture capital community where you actually raised some capital or received it and then it grew to a moonshot, you know, hockey stick kind of growth? Yeah, a bunch of different projects. The failure rate in venture backed startups is um, daunting to those wanting to enter the space. <laughs> the odds are against you from day one. Uh, but I had a one really good outcome. We were able to grow an organization up to 50 people, multiple states, uh, doing you know quite a bit in meaningful revenue. Uh, had one that was what I still believe to be one of the better ideas uh, I've had in my career. Uh, that failed due to uh, some founder issues, it's timing. And, um, and that's what's tough about the zero to one space is it's all about getting a great idea, raising capital, finding product market fit, and burning through that capital to go create something that can make a dent in the industry. It's really inspiring. It attracts a lot of really smart people. Um, back when I got started my career. It's why hundreds of thousands went to California in 1849, just for that's exactly what gold I was just and they never say. got anything. Most of them never got a dime from it, yeah. The new gold rush, get out, get out to the coast, go raise venture money and, and go make a dent in the universe. And it's a very uh, inspiring way to build a career. And that's where I got, you know, the first 10, 12 years of my career started. Um, what I found, though, is that there's definitely a downside to that way of building companies. Uh, the advantages are you can be very mission driven. You can recruit great people. Uh, you can raise capital from great investors. Um, the downside, though, at least in my experience, was it didn't feel like I was building something long-term and sustainable and purposeful. I felt like every time we were building a venture, we were uh, scaling at the expense of so many things, personal health, uh, scaling at the expense of the customer sometimes, because you have these growth targets that you have to uh, get in order to reach the next round of financing, in order to secure capital, to keep the company alive and to keep the company going. Um, to some, that is their, that's their fever dream. Uh, to me, it left something a little bit to be desired. I, I liked building for the long term. I, I liked being surrounded by people that um, I, I wanted to build alongside for decades, not years or quarters. And I, I wanted to build a company that had a little bit more soul and that had a little bit more purpose in the community. And I wouldn't have said it that way at the time. But looking back, I can I could see what was left wanting in that part of my career. Yeah. So what was the call? I mean, what, what you say, hey, I'm getting out of this venture VC back stuff and I'm going to start acquiring small businesses. I mean, what was like, do you remember the first initial thought? He goes like, no, this is too frustrating or it's more lucrative on this side. It was actually or, much more unintentional and accidental than that. Uh, so I'll tell you the, the abbreviated version of the story. Uh, it was about seven years ago when that great idea uh, that I referenced earlier, this tech startup, we had to close down. And at the time, I was really disappointed that this uh, phenomenal SaaS platform that we were building um, had to be disbanded, in part because we didn't have the ability to raise the capital we needed to keep building the technology. Yeah. And at the time, my business partner, Adam, uh, in Dakota Group, a Adam and I went down uh, into the desert of southern Utah uh, on a backpacking trip. And we, it was one of those long, grueling grinding days where we were just logging miles and nothing to do but talk one another's ears off. And we had this idea of starting a small business, not to hang our hats on and to build our careers around that, but as almost a passive, the goal would be to create a passive income stream, hire a general manager out of the gates, uh, invest some capital and, and, and try to have it be a sideshow so that if successful in one, two, three years, Maybe it could be throwing off some free cash flow and it would be a small incremental into our monthly income. That way, both of us could continue to go build these moonshot ventures. That was the naive 
view at the time. And that led to us creating a little company here in Salt Lake City called Taylor Cooperative. It's a custom suit clothier, a brick and mortar shop in downtown Salt Lake City, really high end suits that are custom made, uh, average sale price of about $1,800. Uh, we opened that up. And 18 months later, we were doing a million dollars a year top line in revenue. Um, it, uh, it was profitable. We started it up on a teeny tiny budget of $750. And every year from there, got better, more fun, more lucrative. Uh, we hired better people. And it was largely autonomous of our time. We were involved, uh, a, a very kind of hands-on advisory board and sometimes having to jump into the day-to-day. -day. Um, but it was while building that business that I think my eyes, at least, were certainly opened to the world of small business, which is the majority of the economy, right? Um, the, the, the chief most employer in the United States, the majority of where people get their paychecks small comes from yeah. small business, businesses with fewer than 500 employees. Yeah. And it was an entire section of the economy that I'd overlooked in my career. I, I, I actually kind of looked down on, on small business, I think, small services businesses back when I was building technology ventures, because I was like... Do something meaningful with your career. Go make a dent. Go try to change the world. That was at least the mantra that is, you know, steeped in, in Silicon Valley and, and other tech hubs. Uh, but while building that business, I, I found some of those perks and some of those areas that left me wanting prior, those itches being scratched. Of We had a phenomenal team. You know, we would host... Um, company kind of holiday parties over at, uh, at, our, at my house. And we got to know their spouses. We, uh, we, we, we were building this really, really purposeful organization where people were passionate about the product, passionate about what we were building. And that was the beginning of, of my journey, falling in love with small business. Yeah, so this journey you took, uh, uh, this hike you went on, was that the, what are we gonna do next kind of uh, track that, you guys started rumbling. I got a question about this uh, in this uh, revenue from this company that you did, Taylor Cooperative. Did you actually produce more revenue from this in a short period, shorter period of time than you did at the SaaS company? <laughs> I've actually never <laughs> thought of it. Um, candidly, probably yes. In 18 months, um, Potentially, yes. I'd have to go back and do some comparisons, but <laughs> ironically, this moonshot fast growing side of my career uh, didn't grow as quickly as the slow uh, growth side of my career. I no, never thought of it. I, I remember we got some, uh, we raised some capital for Turbo Squid from Intel, and then he's like, okay, the door is open, and it was crickets. There's just no revenue, no customers, no, it was a marketplace, and it just wasn't happening for a long period of time. Yeah. yeah, you learn some really powerful lessons, though, when you are building companies from zero to one. Uh, you, you learn a lot about customer validation. You, you become kind of a multifunctional Swiss Army knife entrepreneur because you have to wear all the hats, HR, finance, marketing, sales, product. And I think, you know, looking back, you know, fast forwarding seven years later to founding Taylor Cooperative, where we're sitting today, I, I think... What Adam and I are seeing is that it's really helped us have a much more holistic view of company building and, you know, come into conversations with prospective acquisitions, allowing us to more deeply understand how the organization functions. Uh, a lot of holding companies today are, are built on this uh, strategy where you go and you buy an established business that's enduringly profitable. It's been around for a decade plus. Uh, maybe it's year on your growth rate is in the single digits, you know, maybe double digits if you're lucky. And the strategy is make the acquisition, bring in some debt if that's how it's financed, and don't mess the business up. <laughs> don't pull it off of its trajectory. Right, right, right. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but a lot of what we do at Dakota is kind of the opposite of that. And it's so deeply influenced by mine and Adam's background where we come into uh, our, our companies and we uh, definitely try to deeply understand the founder's intention, their dream for the business, uh, understand so that we can honor their legacy of what the company was built on because they, they created that company out of nothing. And we've been there and we can respect how hard that is. And they've done something that most entrepreneurs fail to do, which is catch that genie in a bottle, product market fit and create a lasting company. But we come in, we respect that, we understand that, and then we go try to enhance it and bring these uh, resources to the table that most small businesses just don't have. You know, a full-fledged marketing team, a finance team, an HR team, so that we can run, for example, a FANG level caliber recruiting process inside a small services business competing with, you know, high technology recruiting processes in this teeny tiny, you know, few hundred dollar a year revenue business where there was no 
hiring function before we came on board. Um, so yeah. I'm skipping around a little bit, but to us, that is one of the powers of the holding company is you have the ability to learn from each uh, company. And you have the ability to build a, a shared resource organization at the hold co level that can give each operating company an unfair advantage. I want to tap uh, into that, something you said about, it's sort of like an apprenticeship that you went through in this startup, learning the avatar of the customer really deeply, what motivates them, who they are, what demographic, what psychographic, and then bringing that skill to a small business so that you understand that industry. I, I got to tap into that because that's really important because you're in the startup, you got to figure out, uh, you know, you don't have the luxury of time. You don't have revenue coming in. You're spending somebody else's money and the runway is right here, right? And at the end of the runway, it just drops off. So if you're flying this big jet, just know that it's dropping off. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I often liken the venture backed ecosystem as being built, and, and this is maybe a little too um, critical, but uh, as being built on the arrival fallacy where you're trading a lot of things in, in that year and a half after you raise funding, where like you said, you have a very clear runway and you have to move as quickly as possible and break as many things as possible to get to that next mile marker so you can raise your next tranche of funding, whether it's revenue, customers, a product milestone. And so, it, it creates this culture where you're working 60, 70 hour weeks, you're stressed, you're yelling at people all the time, or at least I was, because we, we have this finite deadline and, and it creates this culture around intensity where you have to force the company into existence uh, because the world uh, prefers atrophy. It prefers not to have your company in existence. And your job as the entrepreneur when you're going from zero to one is to go change that, to go force your company into existence. And, um, and one of the beauties that I've seen on the other side of the economy of small business, where when you make an acquisition, you try to go from two, or sorry, you try to go from one to two or one to 10, is you have a business that's already captured that, that already exists in the world. And your goal then is to help make improvements so that you can unleash its potential to greater heights. It's a very different way of operating. There's some entrepreneurs I know who are incredibly gifted at zero to one, and that's what they're wired for. And then there's others who are more gifted and more wired for one to two. And that's where I think me and my team really specializes, the professionalization process, the digitization, and really helping a great idea reach its full potential. Yeah, uh, there are some gifted people at Zero to One. Now it's those guys that uh, all, uh, uh, you know, David Sachs and Calacanis and Tamath Paula Hapatia. Those guys are really good at going from zero to one. Anyway, uh, how did you, let me ask you about uh, your partner. How did you know that this is the guy, individual that you can confide in, trust, and with your money and with your secrets and your everything else? Yeah, I have, um, I'm biased, but I have the best business partner in the world. And I think we've built a partnership that uh, took a lot of work. And seven years later, still takes work, but we have reached the point that I, I think, you know, anyone wants in a, in a partnership where, you know, we can kind of finish one of those sentences to use a cliche and where I know whether he and I are on the same page just instinctively. In fact, I even know when we're not on the same page and I don't even need to talk to him because I know we're not on the same page on a certain issue. We just, we have well, what this. Are, what, are those looking, what does that look like? Just curious. Because I, I always tell, I, I love this story. I don't know. Uh, somebody was telling a story about where, hey, I want this guy brought uh, Charlie Munger to a party and say, hey, I want you to meet this guy. He's kind of like you. And it was Warren Buffett. And then they sat and talked for not just the hour dinner party, but it was the next six hours. They talked about business and life and yeah. expression. And yeah. Charlie is a conservative who votes Republican and Warren Buffett is liberal who votes Democratic. So they're completely different political aisles, but their minds to come together to make one plus one equals eight. Yeah, we broke a convention, which was we were really close friends prior to going into business together. And, and you hear often, don't, don't do business with friends, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's tested our relationship for sure. I, I think the best business partnerships, best marriages, the best um, partnerships in a business setting are born out of, um, you know, really having this deep level of self-awareness, knowing myself, a deep level of respect and appreciation for what you don't know and what that other partner brings to the table and then trust over time. Um, I heard some advice actually on a podcast uh, a couple months ago that has kind of stuck with me, uh, which is a, a recommendation on how you build a great partnership is 
try to make it a contest of who treats the other better, who showers the other better in, you know, give, setting, them up, setting them up for success. Or when there's a conversation on calm, who can be more gracious to one another? I don't think we practice that perfectly per se. I'm not going to sit here and say that's our idea and we do that well. But a great partnership takes work, you know, and, and there's times when uh, Adam and I are probably at each other's throats. But there's also times when, you know, at the end of a really long week where we're exhausted and where it felt like everything went wrong, it's like, Adam, can we grab a beer? He's like, yeah, let's grab a beer. And in those moments where you have that camaraderie in the battle of building companies, uh, it pays for itself infinitely fold. So it's an act of humility. It's an act in like, you know, knowing yourself and, and, and respecting and honoring your other partner and trying to treat them really well. You know, we're, we are benefited by the fact that at Takata, we haven't raised outside capital. Uh, essentially founding company one, profits of that funded the acquisition of company two, profits of one and two funded three, one and three funded four, and so on and so forth. And, and refusing outside capital has been a very deeply close value that Adam and I have held since day one. In well, part, that takes your scars from VC capital. Exactly right. In part shaped by those scars from VC, which is uh, I, I tend to prefer move today moving more slowly and intentionally but being in control of our company's long-term destiny than the alternative. And we essentially flip the VC model on its head. On its head. And what I, the reason I bring that up on the heels of talking about our partnership is it allows us to operate in a much more long-sighted way, hence the name Dakota Group. It's a nod to decade where the best companies plan and think in decades, not living from one financial quarter to the next. And what that means is sometimes, you know, Adam and I, slow down and say, you know what, Let, let's slow this thing down and let's make sure that we're on the same page before we, we advance this idea. Or, yeah. you know, we just have removed that pressure of speed because of that finite runway we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, where when that's off the table, it really lightens the load. Now, we're oh, both yeah. driven individually, um, and so we're still quite driven. We're still, you know, growing the that's, aggressively. That's, that, that's like re the leasing attachment. Like, hey, man, you're going to die anyway. So just like, take your time. <laughs> Poor bit dumb, but I, I think that's probably right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you said uh, raise outside capital. How did you purchase that first company? Was it all, all cash or did you have some debt or what? So we started our first company uh, seven years oh, so, ago. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then we made our first acquisition about two years ago. Uh, we financed that through our own equity and some debt. We made our next acquisition using our own equity and no debt. Uh, we made the next one after that using our own equity and a little debt. And then we financed the last one just with our own equity and a seller note. So we've, across four acquisitions, we've been fortunate where we've only had to use debt twice. And so what that means is across our, our entire holding company globally, our debt service is, is quite favorable. Um, now, could we have grown much more quickly and aggressively had we raised outside capital or brought in more debt? Almost certainly. Um, but, you know, we're on this long term multi decade mission where really what we're trying to do is make a dent in our community here in Salt Lake City and, and create a special Utah holding company, acquiring what we call community asset businesses, where these are businesses that actually have a real human connection with the comp with the community on their block in their in their local neighborhood or globally in, in their own sphere of influence. Uh, we, we feel like business has the opportunity, especially small business, has the opportunity to transcend beyond just a money-making vehicle and, um, and really become a rich part of the community. And that was shaped by our founding of Dakota being on the heels of COVID-19 when we watched 30% of Main Street businesses close overnight. And uh, we watched the richness of our local community start to erode. And Adam and I decided, you know, if, if we're building a holding company together, Let's build one that encourages more community asset businesses, not fewer. Let's build the kind of Salt Lake where we have fewer Amazons and large mega corporations and really find a way to steward special community asset small businesses in Salt Lake. Uh, when the owner's ready to retire, instead of those businesses shutting down, let's be a buyer of choice where we can acquire it, steward it, honor that legacy, but also grow it into its next chapter. And so that, that's what our entire mission is predicated on. Well, what is your thesis on that? I mean, you're, is it a very specific, uh, like if I look at Constellation Software, uh, Mark Leonard, he'll say, hey, we're looking for business in between this and this revenue, uh, this type of, and, and this type of management, et cetera. Very right. specific. Yeah, our thesis is absolutely evolving. So to explain how we got to where we are today, I have to take a step back. So Adam and I, unfortunately, are not independently wealthy, nor do we have a rich uncle. 
sadly. And so what that meant is that in order to go build a multi-company holding company, we had to move slowly and use our own financing. And so that's meant that we've had to buy smaller than average small businesses. Uh, I, I sometimes refer to small businesses that are doing less than about 5 million a year as being in the death zone of small business. Because when you're under 5 million a year, you do not have a robust management team. You don't have a professional operator usually. Um, and your, your room for error is next to nothing because you're just so small. And that carries a lot of risk. And that's why typically holding companies are acquiring much larger than a business. Yeah, they have management in place. Yeah. Exactly right. We didn't have that luxury. Had we had that luxury, we probably would have bought larger businesses. On average, the businesses we've been buying are doing between two to five million a year in top line revenue. Um, and, and so that's quite small. And that's all we could afford to buy. And so really what we've had to focus in on is exclusively acquiring businesses where we believe we can roughly 5x the business in roughly five years. So in other words, we're highly diversified across our portfolio of five businesses. We have a luxury retailer, a fine art studio, a construction firm, an electrical contractor, and a custom hat maker. Highly diversified, a little bit ADD. And the reason that um, we're, we're not focused on that is, is diversification is, is explicitly part of the thesis, but we're buying at such a small level where we're having to look for businesses where there is an opportunity that we can take our experience in building zero to one and deploy that into the operating company and accelerate growth. So for example, when we bought our first business workshop SLC, we closed the year out having five X the business in the first 12 months, the next year, 400%. Um, and year How on big year, is it when you purchased it, workshop it SLC? Years. Yeah, teeny, a few hundred thousand a year. Okay. Um, okay. So it was a very, very small proving grounds for us. And we were able right, to come right, right. life into a business that, that really kind of deserved it. Uh, and we've moved up the chain since then. So year on year this year, we've grown about 55% organically, irrespective of who owned it. We've been able to grow revenues 55% year on year in our first year of ownership. The bottom so, line net income or even a revenues? That's of top line revenue. Oh, okay. And so... Again, kind of our thesis is built on it's not the traditional model, which is year one, try not to optimize for growth. Just get in there, learn the business and keep it chugging along. Our thesis is, no, let's jump in there and let's go breathe some love and energy into the brand, into the marketing funnel, into the sales team. Let's bring in a professional management team and let's go pull that lever of growth rapidly so that we can get out of that small business debt. Small yeah. business. So that, that's a challenge presents a challenge. I mean, it's, Small businesses definitely have upside because they're not optimized, but you have to become an expert in the niche and you've got three different niches here. And I'm seeing like, you've got a workshop for artists, uh, built by design, a construction company and a hat maker kind of haberdashery kind of deal. So how do you become like your fingers in the business and becoming a niche on this? What are you doing? I mean, what's integral to that is one of our primary duties, which is hiring a great operator who knows the industry well and supporting them uh -huh. and building a great management team and giving them a long-term runway to being successful, right? So in other words, if Adam and I had to become experts in the general contracting business, the electrical contracting business and custom hat making, uh, we would certainly fail. <laughs> we, we can't. Now we've come a long way since our ownership of each of those businesses, getting to know those businesses, working with the management team to identify the levers for growth and value and helping them focus on that. But our job, is to be that hands-on advisory board that we were with Taylor Cooperative in the early days, which is help our operators and management teams identify what to work on, put a budget together, develop a cohesive strategy, and meet with them regularly to make sure that we're moving the needle on that. Um, so it, it comes down to this process of almost letting go, right? And, and not being in the trenches in every single one of our businesses, and instead entrusting and empowering the operators that we plug in to go do that on our behalf and work alongside them to be successful. Yeah. So did, how, how long before in the workshop SLC did you find somebody to run that? Because well, it's pretty uh, small revenue, not enough revenue to actually pay a general manager. How long did it take to find somebody? Yeah, so in three of our five businesses right now, uh, we kept the original operator, the original team in place and promoted from within to allow them to okay. step up. And, oh, okay, okay. Right. and so that's what we did with workshop. That's what we did with built by design. And that's what we're currently doing with Tat and Barrett, our hat maker. And so that's not always the playbook. It kind of depends on the seller, right? And what infrastructure is already in place. Sometimes the seller is like, hey, I, I want to 
I want to step up and, 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 and continue running the company alongside Dakota Group for the next three to five years. Others are like, hey, you know, I'll give you as much time as you absolutely require, but then I'm out. Um, and, and our job is to figure out where they are on that spectrum and build a plan around that. Yeah, let me ask you about that because a lot of people, what happens is if you, you say, you know, it's either the number one guy goes, okay, I'll sell you and I'll stay with you for a while, but I want out because I'm burned out. But then you take over a lot of the duties that he was doing, the hats he was wearing, um, and now he's a lot freer to do what he actually likes to do. How many times did that happen with your five acquisitions? That is or one of the most relevant. Yeah, that is one of the most relevant topics of conversation when we meet with sellers, and, and we meet with sellers regularly here in our community. Um, and, and oftentimes, whether they're staying on or not, the way we try to position Dakota Group and help them understand the role that we play is, as founders, we understand and honor what you've built and the legacy that you want to maintain, first and foremost. Second, we, uh, we can bring to your small business a breadth of resources on day one that you haven't had the ability to afford, whether it's, again, an HR process, a head of marketing, a head of finance, and, and we can come in and we can provide what you've always wanted to provide and help give it that jet engine fuel to help it reach the next level. And third, if you want to stay part of that, We'd love to work alongside you if you want to take two bites out of the apple. We'll give you some liquidity to acquire the business outright or majority today. And if you want to build alongside us, uh, we're, we're happy to build a plan around that, assuming there's chemistry and, and alignment between us. Um, so whether they stay on or not, that's a great position early on in those conversations. How, how do you prove that when you say, hey, I, we can bring a ton of resources that will free your time up to, to do what you like to do in the business? How do you prove that? Do you just say, hey, oh, well, Here's our accountant, have a conversation with them. And how long does that process take you convince them that we have these resources? Yeah, we call it our car wash. Um, I stole that term from Chen Mark, um, who we deeply respect and who are years yeah. and years ahead of where we're at at Dakota Group, where you have this beautiful truck. It's a little muddy, but it's a beautiful truck that goes into that car wash. And by the end of the car wash comes out as a squeaky clean, shiny new truck that is, you know, adopting gap accounting principles that has a refreshed brand, a digital marketing funnel. It has HR practices from a handbook to a recruiting process and so on and so forth. So sometimes it's just showing them what we've done at the other company, showing them our track record, uh, letting them come into the office and see the kind of people that we hire and what they care about and what we talk about. The fact that we don't have outside capital. Uh, the kinds of businesses we've acquired and the role that they play in the community um, and, and really just letting our track record ideally speak for itself. Yeah. When you have these portfolio companies, uh, how is the communication? Are you in deluge with calls? I mean, the, the extreme, a lot of calls, Hey, I need help to, I don't hear from anybody until there's a problem or, yeah. or how or are you actually putting your fingers in and helping them along the way? Yeah, so we, we developed something we call the operating company maturity scale a few months ago. And what it was was this attempt to try to figure out what our companies need the most from Dakota Group right now yeah. and to help communicate to our operators and their management teams what ideal looks like. So it's a one to five scale, five being high maturity, where the management team is uh, incredible. They're focused on the right things. They've in there, they've done that before, they have a budget, they can develop the budget themselves, and Dakota operates as a board of directors effectively. On a one side, meaning we've either freshly acquired it or it's smaller and, and in need of some professionalization, uh, Dakota is deeply involved. We're in there daily. We're helping run the business as well as build it. Um, and it's full contact sport day in, day out, uh, helping the company grow and get to its milestone, helping the company hire people, helping the company find a great operator. And we went through and we scaled, we scale our operating companies on a quarterly basis. And that net average, that one to five score across five companies, that net average essentially defines how busy we are. If Adam and I and my team at the Dakota level are slammed and work at 60 hour weeks, it's a result of some immaturity. And I don't mean that in a bad way, immaturity on our journey uh, across the portfolio. When we get to a point where our net average is over about a three, um, that means we're acquisition on. We're ready to rock and roll and add to the portfolio. And the goal that we communicate to our operators and the management team is while we are here to support full-fledged with shared services, hands-on involvement when you're at stage one, the goal is eventually to move to stage two, three, four, and five. And our job eventually These is to are hire. Out, right? These are get out, out to your yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. And so, so each operating company is on their journey. The idea is when we acquire a company, 
we make some one-time investments, capital and time. Um, and the goal is to put that capital into a really effective car wash, get it on track for strong growth, hire a great operator and a great management team, implement technology, so on and so forth. And then the time is the time that it takes to go do that. We're doing a lot of things that aren't scalable in year one. Uh, we'll even burn down EBITDA in year one if we have to in order to position the company properly for multi-decade growth. So we're almost on the spectrum of like a Berkshire Hathaway on one end to like Y Combinator, a, a venture studio or an accelerator. We're, we're much closer to a, an accelerator than we are to a hands-off holding company, especially early on. And that's fine. You know, that that's a part of our model where in lieu of outside capital, we're putting in sweat equity and time in order to go build our companies and get them out of the debt zone. And then ideally long-term, we're buying companies a little bit larger in size where some of that autonomy and professionalization comes with the acquisition. Let me present a potential problem like the Northern Electric and Built by Design Construction. It's a service type based business. Uh, and if you turn on a funnel and they get a lot of businesses, you can only scale by how many people you need to hire to help do the jobs. How do you, if you had a problem with a guy who was, he's great at running this uh, $500,000 business, but he's not great about hiring and running a $1.5 million business. How do you handle that? Growth is hard and growth really helps you hone in on what matters most as a holding company, as an operating company. Um, the, the faster a company grows, typically the more it burns an EBITDA. It's hard to grow 70% a year and put down 20% EBITDA margins. It's just really, really hard to do. Typically, the more you grow, the more you burn, the slower you grow, the more profitable you can become. We are currently growth on. That's our focus at Dakota. And what that means is we are operating, we are optimizing for growth. And as you're growing the rate we are, again, about 55% year on your growth from 2022 to 2023, uh, you're breaking a lot of things. You're breaking process. You're outgrowing software. You're outgrowing and sometimes people. Um, and, and what I communicate with our, our management team is our job as operators and leaders is we have to grow and develop personally and professionally at a rate just as fast or even faster than the growth rate of our companies. And for me at Dakota Group, that's a big order. We 3 x our holding company over the past 12 months through acquisition and organic growth. Have I developed professionally 3 x I'm not so sure. I have really big shoes to fill. Um, and, and I communicate that as well out to our operators. Our, our job is to invest in you, send you out to conferences, get you a, a professional coach or an executive coach, if that would be helpful. And, and your job is to grow at the same rate or faster than the company. Sometimes we outgrow people. Um, and that's a really unfortunate part of the, the stage that we're at. Uh, we always treat people incredibly well. We, we part with them on great terms. Um, and usually it's quite obvious when we outgrow an individual why. You know, we, we're very good at identifying, you know, metrics, uh, leading indicators on how the business is performing, what's going well and what's not, so that we can have a really honest and kind conversation around how a business is performing and what's standing in the way of growth. And unfortunately, we have to operate um, in a really growth oriented mindset right now, because again, any business that's doing less than 5 million a year in sales is in that death zone. The death zone of Mount Everest is once you reach over a certain level of altitude where your room for error is low. You have no cushion, uh, you have to move quickly and you have to get out of that death zone as quickly as possible to return back to base camp safely. I almost liken that, it's a little extreme, but I liken that to the businesses we buy are in that, in that death zone and we need to get out of that death zone quickly. Um, and to do that, we have to implement technology, we have to level up, we have to grow quickly. And that's that's the process of where we're at. And so while we've made four acquisitions in 24 months, right now our average maturity rating across our portfolio is lower than it ought to be. And what that means is we're really hands-on. And what that also means is we're not looking so, at acquisitions. Yeah, what are you saying when you're saying that maturity rate is low? Yeah, it means we're very hands-on. It means... Um, you know, some of my peers run a holding company and they act more as like an independent sponsor. They're out acquiring companies and looking at acquisitions all the time. We have to balance looking at acquisitions and running our companies. You don't have a mandate for 30% growth, right? For 50% growth, which would right. put some, yeah, gotcha. Right. Yeah, so right now the theme is, is let's get our maturity scale up. And that's a really kind of wonky way of saying it. But right now we're building capacity in our businesses. We're hiring better and better managers, we're adding to the management team, we're supporting our operators, and we're helping them increase capacity to drive growth across the portfolio. Even if that means we're gonna make fewer acquisitions this year as a result of that, that's the right thing to yeah. do for our long-term mission. 
So who, who do you go for inspiration, coaching, and growth? Yeah, I've got an executive coach. Too. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, across therapy and an executive coach, I, I, I'm able to kind of fill the uh, soul. And then I have um, two really phenomenal peer groups that I was fortunate enough early on in, in acquiring businesses to meet some folks that really inspired me and, and kind of come at ETA entrepreneurship through acquisition from a very different perspective than myself. And um, one of my groups we meet um, every other week. Uh, the other, we have an incredibly active signal group and we get together annually or a little more often. Um, and it's different folks at different stages across the journey. Most of them are you. Uh, no, they're, 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 they're just created. They're not, no one's paying anyone anything. It's, it's peers who have decided you know what? Building is a lonely job, and uh, it's really helpful to have camaraderie and guidance as you build. And so one of them is a group of holding company CEOs. We all run holding companies at different stages and sizes. Uh, the other is different acquisition entrepreneurs at different stages. And um, that's been really helpful to me, John, because it is a very lonely process. And emotionally, the, the more I'm able to show up for my team and be present and focus on the right things and not get distracted by the wrong things, the better we perform. And uh, I'm taking that kind of new part of my job really seriously of being really thoughtful and being really decisive with our strategy and the decisions that we make. Yeah. So let's say you're working 60 hours, you're working 60 hours now or whatever that time is. I mean, how, how is that different from the 60 hours you were dealing with the VC companies? I mean, yeah, about seven, yeah, about seven years ago, I, I started to recognize a shift in like what really drives me in my career. I think the first 10, 12 years, um, the folks I looked up to were the Zuckerbergs of the world who were on the Fortune magazine covers. And, and I really got my fulfillment as the front man of my companies. I, I, it was all kind of about me. Um, and the older I've gotten, the more I've matured on that. And a lot of what we are doing at Takata, me and Adam, is operating behind the scenes and assisting our operators in being that front person for their organization. And the fulfillment that comes from that of like really being, again, that hands-on advisory board, I found to be so much more fulfilling than back when I was in the rat race adventure on the treadmill trying to, you know, act like I had everything together and raise financing and recruit people. Today, uh, a lot of where Adam and I spend our time it's incredibly fulfilling. We're in front of the whiteboard with our operators, helping them think through an issue. Uh, they call me when they have to let someone go or when they had a really big deal fall through and, and, and they're disappointed. Uh, so we're a shoulder to cry on. We're a sparring partner in ideas. We're a whiteboard partner, a spreadsheet partner on a financial model. And that, that's really fulfilling because we can take that back seat and we can really help empower and support our operators and their management team in being yeah. successful. So it was a big in my career, but it's been really fulfilling. Yeah, there's a big shift. Do you feel like you're being in a much more of a teacher mentor mode to, yeah. today than versus where you were? The term I use is coach. Is uh, yeah, a good coach is sometimes uh, riding you because you can perform better. Uh, sometimes it's it's rallying because uh, we're here to win and, and you know we're on a streak. And and yeah, it's it's really fulfilling to get you know phenomenal operators who have great industry experience and you know, be that sounding board and really help coach them to success and, and be available to them as, as a partner in crime. Because again, yeah. building's lonely. And so we can kind of play that role on behalf of our operators. And are any of these companies, do the sellers own any percentage of the uh, holding company? Uh, no one owns, uh, no one owns any equity at the holding company level, uh, aside from me and Adam. Um, and so, yeah, we have a couple sellers in the cap tables of some of our operating companies. Okay. How has that changed? Uh, when people start seeing what you're doing with five companies, how has that changed, uh, you know, attention and celebrity? Are any investors coming to you and say, hey, I'd love it. Let me know if you remember she's just taking money. Um, we get uh, a lot more emails a week than I would have thought. Family offices and folks who maybe don't know our focus of refusing outside capital. But I, I take that less about as like a compliment to me and Adam personally and more as holding companies are an incredibly advantageous way to deploy capital. As, as I look at my role, having evolved over the past two years, it's a lot more about capital allocation, human capital, you know, real financial capital. And what's great about holding companies is you have this huge surface area of capital allocation or capital deployment opportunities internally 
Every day, there's a list of something we could go deploy capital into, whether it's buying a truck to improve productivity, whether it's uh, expanding a building, whether it's something small. Um, and then we have external capital allocation opportunities, acquiring companies. And so a holding company is this really beautiful, and this is coming from a naive entrepreneur who's never approached uh, anything in life with the investor mindset. But now we're having to really shift and think a little bit more as capital allocators. And it's a really beautiful vehicle for capital allocation. So we try to keep our capital into three different buckets. Cash reserves, make sure we're always uh, good to go for a rainy day. Internal capital allocation and external capital allocation. Uh, external being acquisitions and tuck-ins and then internal being investment. Does that, does that get an equal split? 33, 33, 33? Oh God, I don't know. We're uh, we're still maturing that process. We're we're pretty. Uh, we're, it's a wild west yeah. right now. Over here, John. But um, but yeah, we're we're um, yeah we're always open to looking at external acquisitions. Right now, our constraining resource is not capital. We have the capital to go take down more acquisitions. Our constraining resource right now is throughput and like operational bandwidth. Uh, and again, coming back to that operating company maturity scale, we need to build more capacity amongst our management team and our operating companies before we get back out on the trail to go make more acquisitions. So, so that's uh, we're doing a management, management challenge that you've got to figure out yourself on how to do that step back. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to be clear uh, that it has nothing to do with a lack of competency with our managers. They're phenomenal leaders across the board. Um, what's tough is we're trying, we have to grow our operating companies at neck breaking speed. Uh, again, 55% year on year growth. So, so why, why, why do you have that imperative? You have to grow at, I mean, fair. Do we have to? No, we would like to, because we see all the time that that lack of redundancy in these teeny businesses, um, that no room for error in these small businesses is a very big risk that we've taken on at Dakota Group. We have made bets that are higher risk, but higher reward. And the way we reduce that risk is to grow out of the death zone and get into kind of better territory where we can recruit, uh, you know, really great managers and operators, add to that team, and we're in a little bit more stable of territory. So instead yeah. of, you know, let me put it this way, in the absence of having outside capital or being independently wealthy, We've had to build Dakota Group with sweat equity, which is, you know, hustling our tails off, jumping inside these businesses and being partners to our operators. And uh, eventually, hopefully we can buy that um, operational maturity and we can come at it more as, as providing capital and being long term owners to an organization that already has a great management team, already has you know a very meaningful level of growth established. Uh, but we're just not there yet. And so we've got to go build to yeah. that destination. Do you have any intentions of? exiting or is this a, a buy and hold forever? Yep. Yeah. It's a multi-decade hold, uh, no intention to sell. Um, yeah. It's um, to, to us because we don't have an IRR, you know, target. We don't have a return on capital we're trying to achieve because no one even talks like that at Dakota Group. To us, the question becomes, would I rather hold this business for a decade or two or sell it for three to six times earnings? Three to six times earnings or 20 years. <laughs> you know, and so for us, where we're building a model where we have this flywheel once fully built, where we can be this advisory board to our operating companies, it's so much more in our best interest to just hold it perpetually. Uh, and that allows us to be better stewards, uh, to acquire businesses that are more like community assets um, and, you know, really build a purposeful holding company that Adam and I set out to build back two and a half years ago. And started. Let me ask you about this, uh, this uh, free cash flow excess and how you decide to pay yourself out of this. Like, how did you decide to pay yourself? Reasonable or is it like Congress going, hey, you know what? We should vote ourselves a raise. And they always do. It, it never fails yeah. to <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think one of the values that keeps Adam and I so well aligned is we are very long term oriented. Every dollar we give ourselves today is a dollar we could have allocated into a phenomenal investment opportunity inside or outside of our portfolio. And we're very cognizant of that. And so our salaries, Adam and I are definitely not the best paid among our portfolio. We're, we're maybe in the top third, but we're nowhere near in the top five or 10. Um, and that's across a small team of 50 people. Um, you know, we're, we're both live comfortably. We're not eating ramen, um, but we are very long sighted. Um, and again, I think a lot of this comes out of the culture of zero to one, where I've built so many startups in my career, John, where I didn't take a salary for the first 12 months and I was truly eating yeah, ramen. Yeah, that's crazy. And, right? um, Until you get so, yeah. by the VC. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think some of it comes out of that. But, you know, long term, um, the goal is that 
know, we want to be able to create really incredible wealth opportunities for our operators, um, help them get into great uh, businesses and have great outcomes. If we're the buyer, when they want to exit and leave the organization, that's great. Uh, let's tee them up for success, pay them really well and, and take great care of the people who run our companies and steward on behalf of the sellers who sold to us. Yeah, I got a question. What what uh, what does Ernest Hemingway mean to you? <laughs> so you're clearly referencing the picture of uh, Mr. Hemingway. <laughs> well, I've got a picture of Abraham Lincoln. So. <laughs> you know, Ernest yeah. Hemingway, I think, is uh, the original Renaissance man. Uh, if you were to pick up a biography on Hemingway, you'd be fascinated to hear all of the stories of him uh, crashing airplanes over the uh, sub-Saharan uh, 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 desert. He's the um, uh, epitome of a man in the arena. He, he you know, is. He is. And and so I think like um, it, it's a it's a really beautiful thing to live an intentional uh, life where you're passionate about multiple things. Hemingway really embodies that. A lot of people know him, of course, for his writing. But as you really start to understand how he lived his life and what really fueled him and the passions he has for anything from bullfighting to hunting to riding to uh, you know skiing in the outdoors, yeah, uh, I expect him to be a great dad or a great husband. <laughs> yeah, some definite, some definite faults uh, in uh, in earnest uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, I think like to me, he kind of represents that shift I talked about seven or eight years ago, where um, the goal really evolved from thinking I wanted to be a Fortune 500 CEO <laughs> naively in my you know when I was 22 and and, and dumb, uh, to really evolving to uh, you know definitely want to be successful and, and definitely here to make a dent in my career, but um, not at the expense of uh, living a really passionate and uh, in, in intentional life with myriad hobbies and, and passions and community involvement that really Dakota allows me and Adam yeah. to have. That's great. Chase, uh, I want to thank you so much for being on my podcast, Top m and Entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a fun, uh, uh, <laughs> wide conversation. So thanks for the good questions and conversation, John. I appreciate you. All right. I hope this video has inspired you. If you need help buying your first million dollar business, make sure to visit me at dealflowsystem.net. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe down below. Comment on it, share it, tell everyone about it. And thanks for watching.